Hopefully that's better. We getting we getting audio? Okay, all right. Apologies. Uh, all right, so uh, last week we wrapped on Joshua, and then this week I, I kind of want to take a slight detour, and I, I don't know if this is going to be a weekly thing. I don't know if I can come up with something every single week, but every so often I want to dip into uh, something I'm going to call uh, uh, a series, if you will, called uh, uh, Used Out of Context. Uh, and I'm going to take uh, phrases or verses or something that is been that it has been, and at times I can still see some people currently using a verse out of the context in which it was intended to be. Um, context, when it comes to scripture, I think is vitally important. Um, anything, it, it, shoot, in, in, entire. Um, doctrines that some false churches believe in are founded and rounded around a single verse taken out of context and used as the entire standing point for an argument. Uh, AJ, be quiet, son. Um, it is the it is the found it, it, it is the foundation. It, taking stuff out of the con, out of context is as bad as removing. Things from the Bible, uh, it's as bad as um, is trying to spiritualize part of the Bible. With context, though, we can gain clarity. A lot of the, the things that people say, well, this seems like a context uh, or, or a conflict in the Scripture, with a with a careful reading, and sometimes you have to go chapters in and around it to get the full context of what's being said there. But if you get it, a lot of times there is no conflict there. What what you presumed was a conflict was you taking a handful of words and creating your own idea out of it. So one of the uh, one of the first ones I want to take a look at, and this is not going to blow this this probably isn't going to blow anybody away or anything like that. But uh, this will be kind of a nice detour. We may shoot back to Joshua here after a while. Uh, it'll just it'll depend on where the Lord leads us. Um, a big one that I have seen used and. Even I have used it um, out of context in the past. Is the term or the phrase as it was in the days of Noah? Um, we oftentimes, and I bet most, some people, probably most people in here have used it as a a phrase and say, "Well, if as it was as wicked as the days of Noah, that is not." what that verse means, and we're going to pick up on that today. So everybody turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 24, verse 36. Jesus is talking to his disciples or his uh, his apostles, the early church, um, about end time things. And in verse uh, 36, he starts out, he starts kind of this port, part of the chapter with a topical sentence that is, uh, this is verse 36. Uh, but of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. So he begins this part of his discourse about end time things, about his about his coming, about the, the great tribulation, about he's, he's talked about, I, I, I think earlier in the chapter he even talks about Israel and, and, and what, what where they're going. Um, and he gets to this portion and he kind of switches gears because above it he's talking about heaven and earth shall pass away but my word shall not pass away and that kind of winds up his thought before and then he goes in and he talks about that no man knows the day nor the hour except for his father and so we're, we're fixing to talk we're, what we're going to be talking about for the next little bit here or what Jesus is start is going to talk about because it's it's all in red here at least in my Bible these are words of Jesus um, is when his arrival will be. When is Jesus coming back? And he says, no man knows the day or the hour but the Father. I would, there's probably not a single person in this room that would disagree with that. Uh, that, that G and then he goes on, but as the days of Noah were, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. Now taken out of context, you just simply have to flip over to Genesis, and we are going to look at Genesis chapter 6, but you have to flip over to Genesis chapter 6 and the stuff preceding, if you read verse 5, you can start in verse 5 of Genesis chapter 6 and start reading some of through that, it talks about the wickedness of the time. And you can make that and say, well, we're going to reach like some type of peak point of wickedness, and that's when he's going to, and that, and I, but that's not what he's talking about. 
Uh, but as the days of Noah were, so shall the coming of man, son of man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage, but until the day that Noah entered into the ark, and they and knew not until the flood came and took them all the way. So shall the coming of the son of man be. So he 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 finishes up the most commonly used, and usually it's just like the a part of the verse that we use, verse thirty seven, as uh as the days of Noah were, and we always say. Uh, as it was in the days of Noah, shall the, and we usually misquote it, but it says, But as the days of Noah were, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. And then he caps it in verse 39 with the same phrasing at the end of the verse, also, uh, uh, shall, uh, so, uh, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Now what is he talking about? It says, In the days that, uh, that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking and giving in marriage. Life went on as usual while Noah was building the ark. Nothing changed. People lived their lived full lives. They were eating, drinking, and giving in marriage. They were living their life as they had always lived it. Uh, for as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking and giving in marriage uh, until the day that Noah entered the ark. And they knew not until the flood came and took them all away. So shall the coming of the Son of Man be. So what he's actually referring to is his coming. He said they didn't know anything was coming until the flood came and took them, and I don't think it's talking about the wi- the wicked, until it took Noah and his family away. They did, They had no idea, because if you, let's, let's read the next verse. Then shall two be in the field, one, t- one shall be taken and the other left. And it reiterates this idea that the days of Noah, when it refers to that, it's not talking about how wicked it was, but how oblivious people will be to Jesus is coming. One shall be taken and the other left. The people that lived in Noah's time, yes, they were wicked. And I am going to go to Genesis. We're going to talk about the wickedness of Noah's time. Just give me some time to get there. But that's not what this verse is talking about. It's talking about how clueless people will be when Jesus comes back. They aren't going to be aware that he's coming. One shall be taken and the other left. Let's continue. Uh, two women shall be grinding at the mill. One shall be taken and the other left. Watch therefore, for you know not what hour your Lord doth come. This is the capstone scripture in this line of text. And, and this thought that he's trying to get across, it's not about wickedness. It's, right. not, it's, not, about, it's not about your job as a saved person is to watch. Everybody else will be oblivious to Jesus coming. I don't think the ta- the catching away of God's people will be a left behind like the movies level event. Right. I don't. I don't. It. it, it I think. I think for some people it will be disturbing. There are a lot of things that disturb a lot of people that don't get any airtime. Um. There's a lot of th- there's a lot of events that happen all around the world. That you'll never hear about on the five o'clock news, right. and I just don't think there's going to be enough to save people left for airplanes to be crashing, right. uh, for for cars to be running off the road, um, for for death and destruction to happen on a global scale. I I just don't think it'll be that level, right. a- and. It seems from this scripture, especially with the two shall be in the field, one taken, the other left. Two women be grinding, one be taken, the other left. It seems like these uh, this other person that's left behind, it doesn't register with them. It didn't register with the people in Noah's time either. We're going to get to this, but the capstone of the scripture is watch therefore. The, the 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 reason that he's bringing all this up is nobody else was watching, but Noah was. We need to be aware of what's going on around us. We need to look at the signs. We need to look, and, and, and Jesus and Paul and Revelation gives us plenty of signs to look for. I think a lot, some of the signs that, that we are currently looking for, um, like for instance, a lot of people look, well, that, that's the mark of the beast coming. If you believe your eschatology the way you claim to, the mark of the beast is not something that we should be looking for. Mark of the beast can take place way after we're gone. That's not a sign I'm looking for. If 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 we if the mark of the beast shows up, we've missed a boat ride somewhere, or at least the way that we claim to believe that we're going to be carried out pre-trib. Because when does that happen? In the middle of the tribulation. We but we got we we have to, and I think that's the kind of stuff that makes us lose sight. That's the kind of stuff that makes us 
eat and drink and have marriage and give in marriage and be like the people that were in the day of Noah is that we're not paying attention to the stuff we actually should be looking for. What are, what are they? When people should say peace, peace, wars, rumors of wars, those are the kind of signs that we need to be looking for and they're all around us. They're all around us every day. So uh, this is what I want to take from Matthew chapter 24. Now let's turn to Genesis and let's actually, let's talk about the scripture that Jesus is referring to, that 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 that, that uh, our Lord was was calling back to. Let's go to Genesis chapter six, and um, we can start in verse five, but let's go let's go to the top of the chapter. And it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born to them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair, and they took them wives all. Uh, which they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit uh, shall not always strive with man, for that he is also, uh, also is flesh, yet his days shall be in 120 years. And there were giants in the earth in those days. And also after that, when the sons of God came into the daughters of men, and they bare children of them, the, uh, the same became mighty men, which are of old men of renown. And God saw the wickedness of, of man was great in the earth, and every imagination and the thoughts of his heart was uh, was only evil continually. Now, this is the specific, this verse 5, and that's why I, I mentioned it earlier, is the verse that people think that Matthew twenty four thirty seven is referring to, is that people are constantly caught up in sin. Now, let's think about, Genesis up to this point. Genesis chapter 1, creation of the earth, or with the largest majority of part of it. Genesis chapter 2, we have that weird interlude, interlude where it seems like it's a creation of man and woman. And then Genesis chapter uh, uh, Genesis chapter 3, um, you get the fall. Genesis chapter 4, um, I think chapter 4 is Cain and Abel. Um, Genesis chapter 5 is some generations, if I'm not mistaken. And then Genesis chapter 6 shows up, and we're here again. And it God looks down from heaven and sees the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he made man in the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, and the creeping thing, and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. Now, God looked down from heaven, saw the wickedness of man, and it repented him that make him. I'm going to go ahead and, and throw this out here. It's no different. It, it has never been any different than it is than it was then. It, it was, we're looking for, you know, the, the, the thing with the way that people usually interpret Matthew chapter 24, verse 37, is that at some point we'll, we'll reach peak wickedness and then God will destroy the earth again. I think we're there. Man doesn't have the ability to peak wickedness because our flesh is just continually wicked all the time. If you look at the progression of the book of Genesis, you have God create man and God create earth perfectly and in perfection and harmony with him and then it falls and things just kind of spiral out of control and i think god especially when you look at chapter six god looks down at on the earth and at everything that he created everything that he spent so much time working on and it just saddened him to see to see the state that things had gotten to not of his doing of man's own doing they had that fall. And the reason that their the imagination of the thoughts of their heart was continually wicked, because that's the flesh, people. That's how that's how your flesh is, that's how my flesh is, that's how her flesh is, that's how his little flesh is, that's how all of our flesh are. And the only thing that sets us as saved people apart from the people in, in Noah's time is that we have a saved half of our spirit. That's the only thing that separates us. I don't think that like the way that people usually take Matthew twenty four thirty seven out of context, I don't think that, that is, it's possible to, for us to reach any more peak wickedness. We repress our wickedness at times. We have social contracts in place that keep us from acting upon wickedness at times, but the imaginations of the thoughts of our heart, they're as wicked now as they were then. Right. I think the only difference between then and now is this is the first time God had ever experienced this level of wickedness. 
He created it perfect, and it just spiraled out of control. And he looks down, and all he can see is filth. Because guess what? There's no covering blood yet. There's no way out of this yet. So all he can see is the stink of the same sin that we radiate every day. Um, and, and the Lord said, I, I think I already read that. Uh, verse 8, But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Amen. A difference maker. Not that Noah was better than anybody that else was there. Not that Noah asked the Lord to receive him and give him grace. Not that Noah dunked his head underneath the water and he somehow found grace. Not that Noah lived in sin as perfection and then got grace. Noah just found grace in the eyes of the Lord. The Lord decided Noah's good enough for the job that I have in store. Um... We're going to skip over a couple of, uh, of, of verses uh, 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 there. Let's go. It talks about the generations of Noah, 9 and 10. talks about Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Uh, and uh, verse 11, And the earth was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. And God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. We're there, people. No different than it is now. And God said, No, the end of all flesh is, be, is come before me, for the earth is filled with violence. Through them, and I and behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Make thee an ark of gopher wood. Room shalt thou make in it, uh, in the ark, and thou shalt pitch it within and without with pitch. God has a plan. All right, I am going to hit the reset button on this entire thing. Now, what's the difference between this and after the flood? Well, after the flood, God had a plan. He was going to set up His own people. He had Abraham coming down the line. Here, here, I think it's chapter, what, 12? In, in five more chapters, and a large number of these deal with Noah. We're going to have Abraham show up on the scene. God's going to select him people. But right now, God's going to hit the reset button. It's like, we, I've, 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 got, I've got to cleanse the earth. I've actually got to watch it. We have to give it a scrub down. So God lays out this plan. He does for us, too. This, 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 this is the thing. This, is I think, is one of the things you can pull from that section of Scripture in Matthew 24, the watching. Noah was supposed to watch for signs. Did God, in, and if you read through this, God never gives him a time when the flood's coming. He just says, work. At the end of the book of Matthew, in chapter 28, verses 18 through 20, if I'm not mistaken, he says, Go ye therefore into all the world, and preach and teach, baptizing him in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. That's a paraphrase, but that's pretty close to the Great Commission. He gave Noah the same thing. He said, just work. And what was Noah working on? Not something that was going to benefit him in his time on that version of the earth before the flood, pre-diluvian earth. Not, the ark served no purpose in Noah's life up until it served the ultimate purpose. You know what? All the work that we do spiritually, it serves no purpose for this world. N none whatsoever. It never will. It, it's never going to gain us anything. Putting hours and hours and hours to the work of the Lord is never going to earn you a big fat car or a house. It's just That's just not how it works. But what are you, you're laying up treasure in heaven. You're, 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 you're laying up treasure for, for a different... And, and that's what no, And that's why that verse 42 is such a good catch on watch therefore. Noah was supposed to just work and watch. Be ready when the flood does happen. Now let's skip to chapter 7, uh, verse 5. And Noah uh, did according unto all that the Lord had commanded him. Now again, I hate to bring this up after, after our study in Joshua, but there's the difference maker right there. Noah did everything that the Lord commanded him to do. Uh, which is, I think, where we fall down. That's where we get off on where a lot of people were in Noah's time, eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage. We're just living our lives. Right. We're not ready for the coming of the Lord. And, and if we, especially if we interact with the fleshly side of our brain for just a moment, and I would say every person here, we don't want the Lord to come yet. we got too much stuff to do. I want to see my grandkids get it. And, and, and I want to see my children saved. But if that's not in the cards... It's just not in the cards. That's how it is. We we should be in tune enough that we should be ready to go at a moment's notice, but we're so locked into this world, and, and I mean hard locked, mm -hmm. that we just don't even think about it. It's like Brother Junior was saying in his lesson this morning about laying up riches and, 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 and focusing heavily on, on money and stuff. That, that, that eating and drinking and, and, and giving in marriage and taking in marriage, 
that life living, the money making, that, that's just what the devil likes to trip us up on every right. single day to keep us from watching and working, for to keep our eyes off the eastern skies, if you will. Um, and Noah was 600 years old when the flood of waters was upon the earth, and he went in with his sons and his wife and his sons' wives with him into the ark because of the waters of the flood, of clean beasts and of fowls that were not clean, of... Um, uh, of beasts that were not clean and of fowls and every everything that creepeth upon the earth, there went in two and two unto no one of the ark, male and female, as God had commanded Noah. And it came to pass after seven days that the waters of the flood were upon the earth in the 600th year of Noah's life in the second month and the 17th day of the month. The same day were all the fountains of the great uh, of the great deep broken up and the windows of heaven were open and rain was upon the earth 40 days and 40 nights. When it was time to go in, no one went. No one went inside. No one went inside with all, all of his people. We we still don't. And and I think that's why it begins that thought. I began the whole thing with reading chapter uh, chapter twenty four verse thirty six in Matthew is because no man knows the hour of the day. That's that's the real crux of that of that verse. It's not. We're not looking for people to get any more wicked. People, they're just going to be wicked. They're always going to be wicked. Almost directly after this, they started building the Tower of Babel. And what was the imagination of men's heart? We'll be like gods. Now, that seems real familiar because if you look at chapter 3, in the fall, what was the devil's promise or the serpent's promise to Adam and Eve? You'll be like gods, knowing good and evil. We go right back to the sin that we've always known. Every single time. There is no peak wickedness. And I think if there's anything that you can take from taking Matthew 24, 37 out of context, there's no peak. We shouldn't be looking for people to get more wicked. We should try to be actively preventing them from getting more wickedness. That's our job. We're the salt. We shouldn't be looking. It's like, well, eventually we're going to get so wicked that Jesus is going to finally come get us home. That's not, we're as wicked as we've ever been. The real signs, the real things that we should be looking for, they're found in the scripture. I'm not going to address them here. You know them. We're supposed, to, we're supposed to always be looking for Jesus' return. We're supposed to always be setting our things on things above, not on things beneath. And, and, and that's hard. It's hard, and, and there's so many obligations and qualifiers that we like to put on it, and I'll even put them on there for you. There's jobs and all this other stuff, but this is the thing. It, God doesn't care. He he came, he lived a full life of perfection for you. You can take a few minutes out of your day to serve him. Right. To be looking for him. I know it gets busy, I know it gets tired. I think the, one of the first things I said to Mamma and Papa whenever I come in this morning for anybody else that got here was how distracted the week will make it. You you can feel, you can spend a whole day feeling like you're wound up and do as busy as you've ever been, and yet still nothing. You got nothing done. Literally nothing done. And that's how the devil wants us to live. He wants us engaged with life and disengaged from our relationship and work for Christ. That's that's how he exists. And that's how he had the entire generation of Noah's day wound up. I bet there was some jeering. I bet there was some laughing. I bet there was some uh, some some name calling with Noah when he was working on the art, but I bet more more than anything, and it's just a lot a lot like this in here. We're kind of a small we're a small crowd. People drive past this church. I have talked to people who work within a couple hundred yards of this building that don't know it exists. Why? Because probably just like in Noah's day, they were so caught up in their own lives they don't see. They just don't see. Maybe they're not drawn to see you can throw whatever sovereign grace quality. And I think we, we uh, this is a, a side point. I talked to Uncle Christopher in front of the dollar store yesterday. He said, I think we use sovereign grace as an excuse right. for not compelling people to come in. He used the word compel, and it, it, it stuck with me. Because uh, was it that was is there a parable about and it said go out one more time and compel people. What does compel mean? You got to grab them. You got to drag them in the door. Compel people to come in. But there are people in this very town that don't know we exist. And there were probably people in Noah's day that walked back past the ark's construction, as big a boat as that was, and didn't know it existed. I guarantee you. Because why? They were all locked up working on life. The devil convinced an entire generation to do that. And you know what? All of them died, save eight. Look around you. There's not many people here. We're losing a generation to life.
Are, are we in the days of Noah? I think we always have been. I think we always will. You know what? Paul, in his letters, he he was so convinced Jesus was on the next cloud. Right. You read some of, some of his, especially when he talks talking about the end times, and it, he was so convinced that the very next cloud was going to be the one that, that, that Jesus was going to step out on. And you know what? We're so much closer now than we were before. We've come 2,000 years since then. Right. We're so much closer now than we've ever been before. Watch. I'm going to go back to Matthew chapter 24. You don't have to turn with me, but I, I do want as a, as a closing thought to read verse 42 one more time. If I can find it, and I'm not too dumb. Watch therefore, for you know not what hour your Lord doth come. Amen. We don't know. He doesn't know. That's the thing. Right. And you, nobody else knew. Noah didn't know. All of a sudden, animals started showing up at the ark. And God said, it's time to go in. And probably Noah looked out of the one window of the ark and thought, it, we've been here seven days. It's hot in here. There's no air conditioner in here. There's one window, and it's on top, and the air's not running through here. We probably should leave. We, I mean, you know that thought at least had to cross his fleshly mind, for sure. We're, we waste, we've wasted our time in this smelly old animal field art. And then the rain started falling. And a fountain did, and, and, and you know what? It, it, it will be those seven years of tribulation... There won't be no destruction here. For most people, it'll be like it'll be like this coronavirus thing. It'll be it, it, it'll be states of emergency, and oh, we'll hear in the Middle East about a a big pit opening up, and all these strange creatures coming out that want to bite and sting. Or uh, boy, that global warming really is working on us as the sun's scorching our skin, and uh, people will do what they do best seems like now, and look up to heaven and curse it. Um, and this is the world, this is the day that we live in. This is the world that we live in. So that's it's kind of a small little lesson there. Ho it, hopefully, and I know it probably didn't bowl nobody over, but uh, we got to watch how we use verses out of context. And right. this is going to kind of be an uh, off and on series as I find verses that get taken out of context regular, and we'll, we'll work, on, uh, work on a little... Uh, Intermediate, intermittent series here. Any questions or comments on today's lesson, Bro brother Junior? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's it, it's 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 the because because really what you're doing is you're leaving you're leaving out a good chunk of the Bible. You're I mean you, you you're taken away you're taken away from the meaning of the scripture. You're uh, the Bereans showed their studied to show themselves approved. Um and and a might bit of study all your conflicts in the scripture disappear. Right. All of them. Brother Jarrett, I believe you had your hand up next. Yeah, I mean that, that. I guess that was the point I was getting across. That's much more eloquently sp said, of course. Um, <laughs> uh, but yeah, I mean we're 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 not capable of getting any more wicked than we are now. We're already totally depraved. We're 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 already we're already as dead in trespasses and sins as we're ever going to get. Uh, yeah. Well, and honestly, the law being what it is, and I'm not talking about the law the political law, I'm talking about the law of the Bible, Paul says knowing the law, all it does is make you a better sinner. In fact, we're more inventive now than they were in the days of Noah because we have a law in which to teach ourselves to be more evil. Oh, yeah, yeah. We're, we're, we're real good at it. We're real good at it. Anybody else? All right, uh, that will do, uh, close us for today. Hopefully, we will uh, we may continue with this. We may go back to Joshua. We may do something totally different. Be prepared and have a good week. Thank you.